<clears throat> okay. So here we go. Chemistry 3111. We're getting closer to the end now. This is the second to last chapter. And this chapter deals with amino acids, peptides, and proteins. You can imagine that this is a really an introduction into biochemistry because in order to understand um, enzymes, which are a type of um, protein and then protein function, you have to understand what amino acids are and peptides. And so we're going to start today by looking mostly at amino acids. And then towards the end of the chapter, we'll talk about proteins briefly. So let's get to it, Nadit. And really, before you start this chapter, you might want to review a few topics that are pertinent and these four topics in particular. So if you've forgotten the Condon Gold Prelog rules or how to designate a chiral center as RNS, you might want to review that. So that's in chapter five. Um, I'm sure that you don't forget anything from chapter 20 because we covered that maybe a week and a half ago or something. So the structure and reactivity of carboxylic acids, uh, nucleophilic acyl substitution, right? Those two topics are pretty uh, fresh in your brain as are the properties of amines. So we're gonna look at basicity of amines. And of course, we're gonna look at carboxylic acids as acids. And so you can imagine that things like PKA are gonna come up in this chapter. So uh, without further ado, let's get into what a protein is. And a protein, if you've ever wondered, it's nothing more than a polymer of a bunch of amino acids, or it's a collection of amino acids linked together. So you can think of an amino acid in a way as a puzzle piece. And if you link a whole bunch of puzzle pieces together, you can make a protein. Now, of course, before you get to a protein, you'll make a peptide and we'll get into that in just a second. So again, a protein is nothing more than a polymer or a bunch of little amino acids all linked together. <clears throat> and you're probably wondering about amino acids. Well, what exactly is an amino acid? Well, an amino acid, as you can guess, it contains both an amino group, so that means it has an NH2 group in it, and it also has a carboxyl group, right, from a carboxylic acid. So we're going to see both of these functional groups in the same compound, and when we see that, we call it an amino acid. Now, there are many amino acids that are naturally occurring. There's many amino acids that exist out there, but the amino acids that we are concerned with in chemistry 3111 are going to be the alpha amino acids. So we call these sometimes the alpha amino acids using the Greek letter to denote alpha. So what makes an alpha amino acid? Well, it's exactly what you think, okay? If you have a carboxyl group, all right, so we have a carboxyl group. Well, since the compound is considered an amino acid, the carbon that is alpha to the, carb the carbonyl carbon, so it's this one right here, the one that's highlighted in green, we call that the alpha carbon. You have an amino group attached to that alpha carbon. So we get an alpha amino acid. Again, there are plenty of amino acids that aren't alpha amino acids, but that is what we're gonna focus on in this chapter. That's the crux of this chapter. Now you're probably also noticing besides the amino group attached to the alpha carbon, you also have an R group. Okay, and what is that R group? Well. We're gonna look at all the different R groups that we can have for the 20 naturally occurring amino acids. We're gonna discuss those in detail. However, there's one amino acid that you can memorize right away, and that is the amino acid glycine. If I just redraw my alpha amino acid like this, you can imagine that if the R group was a hydrogen, well, we already know that there's another hydrogen in there. And so when we have the alpha carbon having two hydrogen atoms, it means there's no chiral center in the molecule, so not a chiral center, this carbon that I have a little arrow pointed towards, and that is the only achiral amino acid, and that amino acid is called glycine. So that is the first one you can memorize. This is called glycine. It is achiral, right? Because again, this carbon has two hydrogens bound to it. So there you go, there's your first amino acid, only 19 more to go, nothing to it, all right? Anyhow, we're gonna get into more of the structures of amino acids later on, but let's get into some more definitions to continue on here. The next one is peptide. I'm sure you've probably heard the word peptide thrown around if you've ever looked at any, you know, biology textbooks or, you know, even if you've just sifted through this chapter. And what a peptide is, it's when we have a bunch of amino acids linked together, okay? Now, if you're thinking, well, how do you link amino acids together? Well, just remember, we have an amino group. So if we take an amino group, 
and we react it with a carboxylic acid, okay, we can react them so that they lose water and then you form what kind of bond? Well, check this out. You end up forming an amide bond. And whenever you hear somebody say a peptide, what a peptide is, it's an amide bond that's formed between two amino acids. So it's a spe specific type of um, amide bond. So again, if you only have a few amino acids linked together, less than 40 or 50, we call that a peptide. If you have three linked together, for example, you'd call that a tripeptide, right? A polypeptide, you know, you get a bigger chain. And again, the peptide bond, okay, I can't stress this enough because this is going to come up Avogadro's number of times today. A peptide bond is nothing more than an amide bond. It's just that when you say to a chemist, hey, I made a peptide bond, she or he is going to know that you made a bond, an amide bond, but it's between two amino acids. If it's a bond, sorry, an amide bond between two non-amino non -amino acids, we would just call that a plain old amide bond. Okay, so we have a bunch of amino acids linked together here. We have three of them, and you can see the peptide bonds highlighted for you here. So when you have more than 40 or 50 amino acids linked together, that's when we get into proteins. And when we say protein, that gives the implication that there is some kind of biological function associated with this molecule. And that's something, again, that we're going to talk about kind of towards the end of the chapter, Not probably not today. So you've heard me knock this around a little bit. I said, well, there's 20 alpha amino acids that are naturally occurring. And what makes them all different, what gives them all an identity is the, the identity of their R groups. Okay, Different R groups mean different amino acids. For example, if your R group is a methyl group, we call that alanine. If it's an isopropyl group, we call that valine, et cetera. And we're going to look at all of them in just a second here. Um, but natural, uh, naturally occurring amino acids, we call those L-amino acids. Now, that's the opposite of the sugars, right? L-sugars, those were, uh, or sorry, the naturally occurring sugars are D-sugars. And I know you all remember D-glyceraldehyde. So if you reverse the chiral center and make L-glyceraldehyde, well, you can see that the amino acids that are naturally occurring have the amino group on the left-hand side, right? So we have two different amino acids here, L-alanine and L-serine. I told you that when the R group is a methyl group, that's an alanine. If it's CH2OH, that's a serine. I didn't mention that one already. But again, I can't stress this enough. The natural amino acids are the, oops, are the L amino acids. Natural sugars are the what sugars? Who can tell me? What's a natural sugar? I'll scribble it down here. Natural sugar are the D sugars. Thanks, Abishi. Good. Okay. So D sugars are natural. L amino acids are natural. Don't ask me why it's that way. It's just the way that nature made it. It wasn't to be annoying or anything like that. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take a journey through the 20 naturally occurring alpha amino acids. Now, if you're a real stickler, and none of you are, all of you are so polite, you know, and I really appreciate that. But, um, you know, sometimes I'll have a student who will raise their hand and say, well, there's more than 20. You know, what about uh, citrulline or something like that? And I'll say, yeah, yeah, I know. I know that there are other naturally occurring amino acids, but there are 20 majorly natural, naturally occurring amino acids. Yes, there are others. I, I am aware of that. But there's 20 that we are going to focus on in this class, and it will get you everywhere you need to go um, here. Of course, in biochemistry, you'll probably see some others. But again, there's 20 that you need to know. So this is where we're going to start. I kind of have them split up here, and this isn't my doing. I mean, this isn't any kind of textbook. So I'll just kind of skip through the slides here and then I'll back up. The first group is anything that has a nonpolar side chain. So your R group is nonpolar. Then on the next slide, I have anything that has a polar R group. Then after that, I have two on the same slide. I have anything with an acidic R group and anything with a basic R group. So again, it's nonpolar, polar, acidic, and basic. Those are kind of the four categories. So let's go over to the biggest category first. And those are the ones that have nonpolar side chains. So something that is completely nonpolar. We've already gone over the first one, which is glycine. Okay. Now, of course, every single compound on here has another hydrogen, which isn't penciled in. Okay. These are all bond line structures. We're just looking at the identity of the R group. So if your R group is a hydrogen, that is glycine. I'm not going to go over the three letter and one letter abbreviations for all of these. Man, I don't have that kind of time because I don't make you memorize it. You'll have this as a handout on your quiz. But anyhow, let's just kind of take a peek here. 
If your R group is a methyl group, then you have alanine. If it's an isopropyl group, we call that valine. It's kind of easy to remember, right? V for valine. Anyhow, that's kind of the way I remember it. Maybe that's helpful for you. Maybe it isn't. So there's a repeat of valine. Then if you have an isobutyl group, so this is an isobutyl group, get this, you call it leucine. And if you have a secbutyl group, isn't that just wonderful? If you have a secbutyl group, and of course it does have a chiral center in it, then it's isoleucine. So leucine is from an isobutyl, sorry, leucine is from an isobutyl, um, isoleucine is from a secbutyl. Makes complete sense, right? Anyhow, and you can see that up to now, the letters have been making a lot of sense, GAV, VLI, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, they started to get a little more interesting in this column. The next one is proline, and proline is actually a pretty unique amino acid. It's the only one where the amine is secondary, right? If you look at all these amino groups, they're all primary amines. Proline is the only one that is secondary. And that gives it some actual really neat um, ability to make some interesting structural function, not some interesting conformation in some proteins and peptides that we'll talk about a little bit towards the end of the class. So maybe you could just pencil that in here that it's secondary. So it's the only one where the R group is tied into the amino group, the only one. Then you have phenylalanine. And so phen if you can memorize alanine, which had a methyl group here, if you add a phenyl group to it, you replace one of the hydrogens with a phenyl, that gives you phenylalanine. Sorry, I'm just gonna text whoever is making that noise that it's really loud. It's somebody in my house. All right, let's continue on. Uh, and you can see phenylalanine has F for phenylalanine. Anyhow, then you get the tryptophan, which has a W, which makes complete sense, right? And you know what? You might look at tryptophan and say, wait a second, there's a nitrogen-hydrogen bond. How is this in the nonpolar section? Well, the reason why is this big ring here, um, this is called an indole. So this giant ring here, this is called an indole. And, um, you know, you might look at that compound and say, well, that's, that's polar. You know, it's got that nitrogen-hydrogen bond. Yes, there is a polar bond. But since the rest of it is all completely nonpolar, it negates the fact that you can participate in any hydrogen bonding. And so it's considered to be nonpolar. So tryptophan. Anyhow, so there you go. There's tryptophan. And if you want a summary of these, you know, it's basically anything with an alkyl group except for the tryptophan. Right? Everything with an alkyl group except for tryptophan is considered to be nonpolar. Then we get over into the polar ones, and I'm sure you can all guess these. The similarities between the polar ones is polar ones, the R group is either, you've got to either have ROH, R -S, your R group has to be an SH, or you've got to have, so maybe I should just put OH, SH, or a primary amide. Those are the possibilities for polar, just to, just to kind of simplify it. So the next one, I'll go a little quicker now, is asparagine and glutamine. And we're going to see aspartic acid and glutamic acid, which are closely related. So you have asparagine. Asparagine only has one methylene before you get to the primary amide. Glutamine has two methylenes, right? CH2, CH2 here. And glutamine's one letter abbreviation is Q. Okay, so if you can remember that one, good on you. The next one is serine, which has CH2OH. We looked at that earlier on. Threonine, which has a hydroxyl on it. It also has a chiral center. Tyrosine. Has a high, it's got a phenol, right? So you have a phenol coming off here. And then, um, then we have cysteine and cysteine. So I always get these confused. So this one would be considered cysteine. So this is, the pronunciation here is cyst, um, you would say like ein, cysteine, cysteine. And then we're going to see C-Y-S-T-I-N-E, which is cysteine. So we're going to take a look at that later on. So cysteine is the amino acid, and it's the only one that has a thiol on it. So this is a thiol, if you don't remember that functional group. Anyhow, and then the last two groups are acidic and basic. So if you remember asparagine and glutamine, so those were like the amide form of aspartic acid and glutamic acid. So we have aspartic acid, glutamic acid. You see they both have carboxyl groups on the end. And then the basic ones, they can get a little bit tricky. We have arginine, which has this interesting functionality out here on the end. Then we have histidine. This five-membered ring here, this is called um, uh, imidazole. So if I just draw the structure here quickly, this is called imidazole. OK, 
Okay. And it, we actually looked at that molecule when we talked about um, uh, aromaticity earlier on in this chapter, so, or sorry, in this class. So histidine and then lysine. So there you go. So we've covered all four subclasses, I guess, of amino acids. So again, we have nonpolar, then we have polar, then we have acidic and basic. All right. So let's get into uh, some more structure and properties of amino acids. So please, if you're a vegetarian, don't throw anything at me. Don't get angry at me over this slide. Okay, this is comes out of our textbook and I will clarify for you here. It says our bodies can make about 10 of the 20 amino acids that we need. So that means the other 10, we call those the essential amino acids. Um, so we would call these, if you can't make it, these ones you would call essential, essential amino acids. And if you eat meat, like if you eat a chicken breast or something, you're going to get all of the amino acids that you need. Okay, all 20 amino acids are going to be found in meat or fish or something like that, milk, eggs, etc. It says there's no single plant source that contains all essential amino acids. I know that's probably not true. I think that soy has all of the, and we'll see here are some exceptions, exceptions, and maybe somebody would say like tofu maybe or soy, right, uh, which I guess is kind of the same thing. But I think that in soy, you do have all of the essential amino acids. But, you know, historically, um, veg before soy became popular in North America, you know, vegetarians and vegans mixed, you know, corn and rice, for example, uh, like to make succotash. And then, of course, that gave them all the amino acids that they need. And people, people have done that all through history, you know, when they haven't had um, uh, a lot of access to meat. Anyhow, just something kind of interesting there. This slide is kind of more of an interesting thing than anything super duper wild. Um, this slide just deals with the fact that, yes, there are many types of amino acids that aren't alpha amino acids. One that's shown here is GABA or gamma amino butyric acid, which is a neurotransmitter, and then thyroxine, which is a hormone. And again, what do they both possess? They both possess a carboxyl group and an amino group. So that, make, that means they're, they, they are amino acids. Another one that you might have heard of before is para-amino um, benzoic acid, P-A-B-A. -A. If you want to look that one up, you can do that on your own time. But anyhow, there are many different amino acids besides the 20 that I just talked about. Trust me, I'm aware of them, but we're going to focus on those 20 that are on the slides. All right. Well, who wants to talk about PKAs? I notice I'm not getting a lot of thumbs ups when I, when I talk, when I say let's talk about PKAs. But trust me, it's not that bad. We're just going to look at it quickly here. So it says under acidic conditions. So remember, if we have the pH scale, so pH scale goes from 1 to 14. Remember that 14 is basic, right? And 1 is acidic. Okay, don't lose sight of that. Sometimes people will reverse that, but you don't want to reverse that. So if we're at low pH, right, if we're in a really acidic solution, what that means is that you're going to protonate everything. Right. Not only will the carboxyl group, of course, maintain its carboxyl hydrogen, but the amino group is going to adopt a proton and become um, uh, an ammonium ion. OK, so you end up protonating. And then overall, the whole charge of your amino acid in this case would be plus one. Right. It becomes we could just put plus one, something like that. OK, so what happens is that if you start ripping off those protons, each of the protons, first of all, all the carboxyl proton, and secondly, the ammonium proton, uh, they both have their own pKa. So you go from a cationic species that we have on the far left, then you remove the first proton, the carboxyl proton, which is going to have a lower pKa. It's more acidic. Then you end up with a zwitter ion. Who remembers a zwitter ion? It's something that's neutral, but has a positive and negative charge in it. Then we deprotonate a second proton, and then we form an anionic species here at a high pH, right? And when we're in a strong base. So we're going to look at what the pKa values are for these carboxyl protons and for these ammonium uh, or the protonated amine, if you will. Well, if you take a quick peek at this table here, and this doesn't have every amino acid, but it's got the first few in it here, you probably notice some trends right away that the pKa of the carboxyl protons, they're all pretty close to two. They're in that neighborhood. They're all kind of around, around two-ish. And then if you look at the pKa of the um, protonated amine, there's a wider range here maybe, but it's pretty close to 9 to 10. 
right? Somewhere in the range of around nine to 10. Okay, so that's pretty easy to remember, just a couple of numbers. Two for the amino acid, around nine to 10, or sorry, two for the carboxyl group, around nine, 10 for the protonated amine. And then the side chains, you see you've got a whole group of PKAs here, and I'll, I'll talk about those more in a second. But here's the second half of the amino acids that didn't fit on there. So again, same old thing. You see the PKAs of the carboxyl groups are around two, around two. And for the protonated amine, they're around nine to 10, nine to 10. Again, they can step outside of there a little bit, but they're all kind of in that vein, okay? And then we see the side chains. Well, they can vary. And like I said, we'll get into that in a little bit. So what are we gonna do with these PKA values? Well, the first thing I wanna mention is, is you know, just how do we draw an amino acid? Something that you might've noticed is if you've done some, you know, looking through the textbook or perusing the internet at all, before I started lecture today, you know, you might've noticed that sometimes when you Google the amino acids, you'll see them drawn like this. Like, let's just draw alanine, okay? So we'll see alanine, I'm gonna leave the chirality out, but we'll say alanine, drawn like this. There's nothing wrong with this structure. So alanine, okay? And then other times you'll Google alanine, you could just do it right now, and you'll see it drawn like this. You'll see it drawn as this Zwitter ion, okay? And if you're wondering, well, why do they sometimes draw it where both groups are neutral, and then other times they draw it as the Zwitter ion? There's a very good reason for that, okay? The reason why we draw them as Zwitter ions, the way I have it shown here, is because we're most of the time when we're talking about amino acids, I don't know if it's most of the time, but a lot of the time we're talking about biochemistry and we're thinking about physiological pH. Well, what's physiological pH? It's a pH of around 7.4. I know somebody will argue with me on that and say it's 7.35 to 7.42 or something, whatever. Okay, it's close enough, 7.4. So what that means is if your carboxyl group, right? We said the pK of the carboxyl group was around two. So if you're at physiological pH, you're in a more basic environment, right? So that means the pH is gonna be such that the carboxyl group is actually gonna be deprotonated, right? So it's gonna exist as an anion. And then if we think about the pKa of the amino group, if it's nine to 10, that means we're in an environment that's more acidic than the pKa of the amino group. So that means it's gonna exist in its protonated form. And so that is why a lot of the time we draw amino acids as their zwitteron. Give me a thumbs up if that makes any sense to you. Physiological pH is right in between the two pKa values of the amino group and the carboxyl group. Great, great, awesome. So let's go, let's dig a little deeper on that. So again, physiological pH, it's a pH of 7.4 approximately is right in between a pH of two and a pH of nine to 10. And so that is why we draw the carboxyl as the carboxylate and the amino group is the protonated form. And that is why we see a whole holy host of zwitter ions when we look at amino acids, not all the time, but a lot of the time we do. And there's nothing wrong with that uh, whatsoever. You could draw it as the uncharged form sometimes too. There's nothing wrong with that, uh, depending on the situation, what we're talking about. And I'll show you some examples uh, of each. So. Let's think about this a little bit more. It says here, a physiological pH, an amino acid is gonna be amphoteric. What does amphoteric mean? It means, if you don't remember, it means it can function as a base or an acid. Oh, that's interesting, right? Because think about it, a physiological pH, it's got a negative and a positive charge. So the negative part can function as a base, it can accept a proton, and the positive charge can act as a proton donor, as you see shown right here, when you treat it with a strong base, this is going to behave as an acid, right? And this is our base, right? Conversely, if you put it in a strong acid, then the amino acid is gonna behave as the base, and this would be your acid. Give me a thumbs up if you're with me on that idea. Acid-base chemistry, you can see how it doesn't go away. You can't escape it. You haven't been able to escape it from Gen Chem 1, and now you're at the end of Organic 2, and we're still talking about it, right? It's such important. Uh, uh, chemistry, that you understand acid-base chemistry. All right, so now let's dig a little bit deeper into this whole idea of the different pKa values. Before I do, I'm gonna ask you guys, I know that many of you have completed biology and I know there's a few of you that have completed some upper level biology classes. 
Has anybody here ever done electrophoresis in the lab, in a biology lab, or anywhere, maybe even in high school? I had one student tell me they had done it in high school. Yeah, so I have a few students who have done electrophoresis. And so if you've studied electrophoresis at all, which is a handful of my students, probably not everybody, and that's okay, then you'll see where we're going with this, right? You've probably figured it out already. Then now we're going to get into what's called the isoelectric point, and we're going to talk about how we can use electrophoresis to separate um, uh, uh, amino acids based on their isoelectric point. So if you're sitting there going, well, what the heck is an isoelectric point, Mr. Dion? Well, it's the pH at which the Zwitter ion concentration is the highest. So you want the maximum concentration of the negative anion and the positive cation. So if you're like, well, what, what's, what's that uh, pH? What pH is that? Well, here's the, the, I shouldn't say easy. I hate that word. The simplest scenario that you can have. That's not much of a better word, is it? Okay. Uh, the less complex scenario you could have is when you have an amino acid that has no acidic or basic side group, okay? So if you just have something with a nonpolar side group, all you have to do to figure out what the isoelectric point is, is you take the average of the pKa values, okay? So I'm not even sure what amino acid they're using here. They didn't state it. Let me go back. So 2.34 and 9.69. So yeah, so they're using alanine as the example here. Alanine. Okay, so alanine's carboxyl group has a pKa of 2.34, and its uh, amino group has a pKa of 9.69. So that means if you put it in a, P a solution with a pH of 6.02, it's going to look like this. Okay, you're going to have the maximum concentration of, son of a gun, of the Zwitter ion, okay, draw, shoot, I'll draw it the way they have it here. So with my Zwitter ion, so I'll even draw the chiral center with the appropriate stereochemical configuration. There we go. So you can have the maximum concentration of this, of the Zwitter ion. What's the charge of the Zwitter ion? Can anybody answer that for me? What is the charge of what I've drawn here? And it's not a trick question. Go with your gut. What is the charge of the Zwitter ion? What is the charge of the Zwitter ion that I have in the circle here? Good, it is zero. I have plus one and negative one. So they cancel each other, so there's no charge here whatsoever. Now, if you're wondering, well, what do I do if I wanna calculate the isoelectric point of something that doesn't have a neutral side group? What do I do in that case? Okay, so if you have an amino acid that's got a side group that is acidic or basic, okay, what you do is this. You take the two pKa values that are the closest number and you average those. And that will give you the isoelectric point where you're gonna have the maximum amount of the uncharged form, okay? The Zwitter ion form. So let's say you have lysine. Well, you've got two basic side groups, right? Of course you have the, um, the, the amino group and then you've got another amino group out here. So those two have the closest pKa's, right? Because this one's going to be around two. So you average those, that gives you the isoelectric point. Similarly, if you had glutamic acid, you take the two carboxyl groups, you average those, and it gives you the isoelectric point. So now you might be wondering, okay, well, what's the relevance of all this? This is cool, I guess, but what do I do with this? Okay, so let's take a look here. So electrophoresis, which is um, a technique that's used to separate amines uh, or, or amino acids by exploiting their isoelectronic values. Okay, so check this out. If you're in a pH, so follow along with me very carefully. I'm going to use my green pen. If you're in a pH that's lower than the isoelectric point, that means you're in a pH that is more acidic, right? So that means that all the amino acid is going to be protonated and it's going to exist as a cation, okay? So let's say you're at a pH of six and you have um, lysine. So lysine has an isoelectric point of 9.74. So when you're at a pH of six, you're in an environment that is more acidic than the isoelectric point of lysine. So that means that lysine is gonna exist in its pronated form. It's gonna have a positive charge, okay? Conversely, if you're in a pH that is higher or more basic than the isoelectric point, then your amino acid is going to exist as an anion. 
So let's say we're still at a pH of six, but now we take glutamic acid, which has an isoelectric point of 3.22. Well, you're in an environment that is more basic than the isoelectric point, right? You're at a higher pH. That means it's going to deprotonate it and it's going to be anionic. Okay, so now you've got lysine. That is a cation, okay? So I'll put here positive. The lysine is a cation, and the glutamic acid is an anion. And you see that the pH of 6 is pretty much identical to the isoelectric point of alanine. So it's going to be having a charge of approximately 0. So then what we do is we take this electrophoresis chamber, we put our amino acids in it, and then we hook it up to um, some electrodes. So we have an anode and a cathode. Well, the anode is the positive end, and what's going to happen is anything that is negatively charged, like the glutamic acid, is going to migrate towards the anode because it's positively charged. Conversely, the lysine, anything that's positively charged, is going to migrate towards the cathode, which is negatively charged. All right? And then, of course, the alanine isn't really going to move, but you see that if you have a mixture of the three of them, you are able to separate them. Now, if you're wondering, well, what if I have two things that are both cations? Are they going to separate? The answer is yes. Whichever one is lighter in terms of its molar mass is going to migrate faster than the one that is heavier. And that is kind of a Sparks Notes version of what electrophoresis is. Give me a thumbs up if you're with me on. Even if you're 60% of the way with me on electrophoresis, you will probably have to go back and read it. I would say that would be completely normal. Absolutely. Good. All right. Well, let's cover a couple more um, concepts here before we take our next break. We're going to cover a couple more concepts, and we're going to take a look at a few practice problems. All right, so let's see here. Um, electrophoresis, that's an analytical scale technique. You can't use it to separate a huge amount of amino acids, but you can do little tiny bits. And another thing about amino acids is that they're generally speaking colorless, okay? So... Um, in your sweat, like if you just, you know, if you're sweating, right, you, you're sweating proteins, you know, that are coming out in your sweat. And you've probably seen an anhydrin stain if you've ever watched any kind of crime shows or anything like that. And in fact, there's a little blurb in our textbook about how they use an anhydrin stain to, to get fingerprints and things like that. But what happens is if you have an amino acid, you can treat it with anhydrin, and then you can actually visualize the amino acid. And that's how they stain amino acids in the electrophoresis chamber when the experiment is done so they can see how far they've migrated. They end up with this purple color product and then you release a whole holy host of products here. You get water, carbon dioxide, and then of course you produce some kind of aldehyde based on whatever the R group of your amino acid was. Anyhow, kind of an interesting thing there. Well, with all of those concepts in mind, which is quite a few of them, let's take a look at a practice problem. So I've got one two, three practice problems that we're going to take a peek at before we take our first uh, or our next break here. All right, 25.1 says, although most naturally occurring proteins are made up of only L amino acids, proteins isolated from bacteria are sometimes uh, containing, or they sometimes contain D amino acids. Draw the Fisher projections for D alanine and D valine. In each case, assign the stereochemical configuration as being R or S. So we know that L amino acids are ones where we have the amino group on the on the left hand side. So if you just um, bear with me here, if I just draw the Fisher projection of L alanine. So we're going to have our R group pointing straight down like this. Okay. And then we're going to have our hydrogen over here. And then our amino group is over here. So this is L alanine. L alanine like that okay so in order to draw d alanine all i have to do is reverse the chirality at the chiral center i'm going to put the amino group on the right hand side like you put the hydroxyl of a d sugar right the hydroxyl is on the right hand side so let's draw um, d alanine so all we have to do is reverse the stereochemical configuration so what i'm going to do is i'm going to copy this and i'll paste it over here Comes ça, as we say in French. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. All right, there we go. So now we're going to change this to D alanine. And the way that we're going to do that is we're going to erase these two groups. Okay. And we're going to put the NH3 group over here and the hydrogen over here. So that's D alanine. 
Now we're going to draw D valine. So we're going to take this guy and we're going to draw D valine. So we're going to copy, and we'll paste our D valine over here. And now we just need to change our R group. So if we want D valine, remember that our R group was an isopropyl group. So D valine, so we have an iso, oops, an isopropyl group right here, like this. So Let's try and assign some stereochemical configurations. So if I just zoom in on this guy here, all right, which one of these atoms is going to take the highest priority when I'm assigning the Conningle prelog rules? We have two carbons, a hydrogen, and a nitrogen. Which one has the highest atomic number? Anybody? Who's got the periodic table partway memorized? Yes, my students do. Thank you, Jay Lynn. Thank you, Maria. Good. So we have one. This is going to be the loser. This is number two, this is number three. So I go one, two, three, that's S. But remember the hydrogen is coming out in front, so we reverse it. So our stereochemical configuration is R. Put the R here like this. And you can imagine that D-valine is gonna be in a similar vein. We have number one, number four, number two, number three. So again, we go like this, but we reverse it and so D valine is also R. So both R R. A R E R. Both R R. All right, there we go. All right, let's move on to the next one. Uh, draw the form of the amino acid that is, is expected to predominate at the stated pH. So for this one, I'm going to, oh Lordy, I'm going to have to go back to these tables here. So I'm just, I've already got it written down because I've solved these already in my notes. But I'm going to refer back to this table that has all the pKa values for everything. So just bear with me as I refer back to that. So let's start with alanine and we'll write out the pKa's of both of the R groups. So for the carboxyl group, so we'll put here for the carboxyl group, the pKa was 2.34. For the amino group or the protonated amine, let's put here like this. Um, it was 9.69. And so our isoelectric point is um, going to be somewhere in the middle, but that's neither here nor there. We're at a pH of 10. So we're in a more basic environment, more basic. Therefore, both deprotonated, right? We're in a we're in an environment that's basic enough to rip off both of the protons. So if we draw our amino acid, which is going to look something like this, okay? It's alanine, so this is a methyl group. So our amine is going to be deprotonated, so it's going to be neutral, and our carboxyl group is going to be deprotonated like that. All right, give me a thumbs up if you're with me on that one. We're at a pH that's more basic. All right, cool. Cool, let's try the next one. For proline, our carboxyl group has a pKa that's 1.99. I'll just write down the number. 1.99, and then our amino group just put here alpha NH3 plus is 10.60. And so we're at a pH that's in between the two. So that means that the carboxyl group is going to be, um, it's going to be deprotonated because we're in a more basic environment, but we're in a more acidic environment than the amino group. So that's going to remain protonated. So we're going to have a zwitter ion in this case. So let's draw out the zwitter ion in our proline molecule. Remember that in proline, right, the nitrogen is tied in. So instead of having three hydrogens, it only needs two. You have a positive charge. And then our carboxyl group is going to be deprotonated. Then we have glutamic acid at a pH of three. So I'm going to write out that our carboxyl group is a pKa of 2.19. 2.19. Our alpha. Ammonium group has a pK of 9. Point, I can't read my writing. I think it's 9.67. And then there's also a side chain. So the side chain is also acidic. So maybe I could have written it in blue, but whatever. No turning back now. It's 4.25. 4.25, Mr. Dion. There we go. So what that means is that we're at a pKa that is um, more basic than the one that I have in blue. And then it's more acidic than the two that I have in um, red and black. And so what it's going to look like is something like this. So our side chain is going to remain protonated because we're in a more acidic environment. 
Then we have our amino group, which is going to remain protonated. And our carboxyl group is going to be deprotonated because we're in a more basic environment than that. There you go. That's all there is to it. The next section or the next question, we're going to have to calculate some isoelectric points. So you might want to grab a calculator for this one. It says aspartic acid. So for aspartic acid, if we look at the pKa of the carboxyl group, it is 1.88. The pKa of the protonated amine is 9.60. And of course, in aspartic acid, there's an acidic side chain. So we'll put here side chain, right? Chain is 3.65. So what we do is we choose the two that are closest. So these two are the closest and we average those. So we say our isoelectric point is equal to 1.88 plus 3.65. And then we divide that by two. So that gives us 5.53 over two. So 5.53 over two. And then we just round. So we get 2.77 as the isoelectric point. I think you probably get the idea now. Um, leucine, we do its carboxyl group. It has a pKa of 2.36. The amino group or the ammonium ion has a pKa of 9.60. And there's no side chain that's acidic or basic. And so we just take the average of those two. So our isoelectric point is equal to 2.36 plus 9.60. We divide all that spinach by two, and we get 5.98. And then the last one, I'm gonna let you do this one on your own. I'll just give you the answer. And it's probably in the solutions manual, it's 9.74. And why is that? Because lysine has a basic side chain, basic side chain. And so it makes sense that the isoelectric point would be much higher for lysine. All right, all that in mind brings us to the next section, which deals with amino acid synthesis. So we're going to take a short break before we come back and tackle that.